The views, information, or opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individuals. This content is not intended to malign or disparage any organization, group, or individual. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtroom of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense attorney based here in Los Angeles and previously a prosecutor with the LA District Attorney's Office for nearly a decade. We are recording this on Monday, February 7th, 2022. And I'm very excited to say that today we are joined by Catherine James and Richard Gabriel, two consultants who work in the field of trial management, jury selection, and the undefined elements of psychology and behavior that affect everyone in the courtroom and beyond. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, before we get into it, I, please tell us a little bit about your background and what your practices consist of today. And Catherine, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, my background is I'm a classically trained repertory actress, and I discovered that theater and the law met when I was huh. 25 and knew everything. And now I'm almost 70. There's a lot of things that I don't understand about the way the world works. But, you know, when I was brave and fearless and knew everything, um, I came up with this concept of how to uh, take what I knew as an actress, a writer, and a director in the theater and apply it to trials. And I've been that. doing it ever since. Yeah. I love that. And it, and it is a theater. We're going to get into a lot more of that uh, soon to come, but it, that's the best way of thinking about it. Richard, how about yourself? <laughs> sure. Well, people ask me this question all the time. And for the most part, the easiest answer I say, well, my mother's a judge. My dad's a psychologist. I do have some theater training with Catherine. So it's kind of like I was meant to be in this thing. I've been doing this for 36 years. Um, I kind of actually met Catherine right around the beginning when we both started this thing. And over the years, you know, I've, I've sort of dabbled in and sort of explored and gotten much more in depth with the social psychology of research, how jurors actually make decisions with the psychology of, and, and also just the communication aspect. That's how I started really was training attorneys like Catherine on communication skills, started working with witnesses, and then got more into the research angle of doing focus groups and mock trials to better understand that dynamic of how the decision making actually gets made in the courtroom. And many, many years later, here we are. Fantastic. I got to tell you, I'm really looking forward to this discussion because I, I, I did 40 something felony trials when I was in the DA's office. So I, I would say I have some experience doing trial work, but we rarely ever talk about this type of stuff, the psychology behind it. And you may pick up notes here and there from your colleagues on things that they've noticed that worked, or maybe you watch somebody in trial and you think I'm gonna try to incorporate that. But as far as the training that we get, it's kind of they throw you in the deep end and they say, here's how it works. You start with uh, with voir dire, you, you, you end with a closing argument. And in the meantime, you're calling some witnesses, have at it and good luck. So I'm glad that we're going to get a little more in depth to some of the inner workings behind it. But explain to me, if you could, a little bit about is there a difference or what is the difference between like trial consulting and jury consulting? <laughs> That's a, th we're both laughing because um, we both belong to this wonderful organization called the American Society of Trial Consultants. And um, I think that the very first way we were thought of was as jury consultants, right. picking juries, because that's what this field did. And that was what it did exclusively. And you know how in advertising they say um, you only have one time to make a first impression and you can't you can't change up. And uh, so people always call us all jury consultants. Right. Well, we do many aspects of trial. And you know what? Some people think, well, why don't we just call ourselves litigation consultants? Because actually we're involved in everything that has to do with the pretrial as well. Depositions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, when, when you say, what's the difference? I would say it's more of an inclusive thing than an exclusive thing. And no matter what you call me, like right now, you could call me Catherine, you could call me Kathy, you could call me mom, you could call me grandma, you could call me honey. I probably would answer to all of those. It's not dissimilar in my professional life as well. It's like, you jury consultant, they go, yeah, whatever. I mean, because why why parse it down? Right. People don't right. get it when you say it, you know. I think Absolutely. most people also um, 
actually a lot of our field would say probably a smallest percentage of our work actually is in the jury uh, selection aspect of it. Quite frankly, a majority of my work is in the pretrial work, whether it's working with witnesses or helping develop themes or uh, doing jury research. A vast majority of our work is in there. So yes, we're in trial, we're monitoring jurors, we're helping in the selection process, but a lot of it is what leads up to the trial. You guys have both been doing this for several years. Have you seen a change in the industry? Are, are, are attorneys more focused on things now than they were in the past? Uh, I, I think that's right. I mean, it's the truth is that we're seeing much more recognition. Uh, there's much more acceptance, I think, out there for uh, a lot of the attorneys. And, and be, part of it is due to that, uh, both on the criminal side as well as on the civil side, there's less and less cases going to the jury. So a, yeah. attorneys like you, Josh, actually are kind of rare. People who've had you know, those dozens of, of trials under their belt. So a lot of times when they do get put in the place where they've got to go to trial, they're sitting there going, wow, I really need some advice on a, a lot of different things, not only just jury selection, but also just making an opening statement. Where do I stand? How do I deliver it? A lot of those components, which they haven't gotten that much training in law school on and don't have that much experience actually in the courtroom with. I also yeah. think it's it's a generational issue, don't you, Richard? I mean, um, like I'm almost 70 now. So when I was 25 and knew everything and was fearless, I would go into a greatest generation uh, law office and I would say, you know, I can help make your lawyers better. And and I, a future old dead white guy, you know, would uh, look at me and say, uh, <laughs> you know, if you'd gone to my law school and you made law review the way I did and belonged to my, your, my fraternity, you just know how to try a case. Well, yeah. I think, you know, one of, the, one of the points that I have become much more aware of is that, you know, for the most part, when you go to law school and you get your training and you even work in a law firm and you think, you know, you are focused on the law and you are focused on the evidence. And those are the two primary things that you really think drive a case. And to a certain extent, Catherine and I spend a lot of our time on everything but just the law and the evidence. It's all about the other things that, quite frankly, in the past, you know, when you study the art of rhetoric or when you studied, you know, way back when, you know, the, you, you just did a lot more trials back then. So you learn just by doing sort of what made an impression on, on jurors and there's less and less of that training, less and less of that experience. And I think more and more people are realizing there's this whole other area that I need to get some training and experience in because it's not just about the law and the evidence. Yeah. I wonder too if this new generation is just much more savvy and attuned to the idea of, of appearance and presentation and how much that matters. And it's not just, like one of you said, it's not just I went to Yale Law School that's going to matter to this jury, but how I present things down to the, the PowerPoint that I put in the courtroom. And will that come across as professional or am I going to look dated and old and like I'm just trying to keep up? Oh, good point. Good point. Yeah. Are you running the PowerPoint or is the PowerPoint running you? Right, <laughs> right. right. Well, I, yeah, I think also, Josh, you, you point out an interesting thing that we've seen a lot lately. You know, the training, you know, the quorum is, a, is, a, is an oral advocacy forum. It is a place where we speak and people talk. And there is a generational thing which, you know, we're pretty visual. We like to see things and our attention spans are much shorter than they used to be. So there is a point where not only do you have to learn how to speak in a way which does appeal to different generations here, but also as a whole, we're less and less patient. We need things to be you know, in really understandable form. We need yeah. visuals to accompany various elements so that we're really sinking in. And a lot of the impact of these trials is that you know, we, testimony comes in, people talking, and jurors get really tired. So we wanna make sure how do you not only use the verbal testimony in a way that makes a real impact on the jurors, but also how do you break it up through your presence in the courtroom, through the yeah. exhibits and demonstratives that you use as well. Yeah, not to go so far on a tangent on this PowerPoint thing, but what you're reminding me of some, 
something someone taught me that really uh, struck home and changed the way I thought about kind of presentations and opening statements, especially when using PowerPoint. And they said, when you're, when you're watching the nightly news, there's the anchor who's speaking to you, and maybe behind them is a picture of a f- house fire. And they're talking about the house fire, and they're talking about how people were, uh, you know, how many people were saved, how many people may perhaps died. But what they're not doing is putting a bunch of paragraphs of notes onto their picture of the house fire talking about three dead, two survived, 15 uh, firefighters hurt, because nobody's going to be sitting there just reading something. And if they are, they're not paying attention to you. And that just was this light bulb moment to me. And I started taking all of the words out of my presentations for an opening statement so that maybe they're seeing crime scene photos, but they're listening to me and paying attention to what I'm saying. And I found it to be far more impactful and persuasive. You know, what you... Let me tell you how often I have said, um, what do your visuals look like? And they give me what you just described. Yeah. Or lots of documents, you know, positive, you know, I got their lot of words, 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 words. And I say, you know what? Those are actually not visuals. Those are auditories. Words are spoken language written down in symbols. That is not a visual image. So you're talking and the words are talking, everybody's talking. And so there's too much of that going on. So what is the image? That's And that's what you discovered. I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's jump into uh, one of my favorite topics and it didn't used to be. Um, when I was first starting uh, in the DA's office, one of the parts of trial that scared everyone the most and that I thought I would not look forward to at all was jury selection. And I think it's that idea of what am I going to say and how am I going to, uh, to speak to these folks? And it, it, you, you, you know, you're in a room full of strangers and how are you not going to embarrass yourself? But what I began to realize is that this is your moment that you can start to introduce yourself to folks and that you can, some of it, a lot of it is about finding out about them, but it's also for the first time telling them, the jurors, that you're a trustworthy person and that you're perhaps a likable person and that you're a person who's gonna present a bunch of evidence to them and that you hope that they rely upon it because of the person that you're first uh, uh, um, introducing yourself to them as. So talk, let's start to talk about um, jury selection and this idea of voir dire. Could you explain that to folks? What what is that? Well, voir dire is voir dire is is actually French for to see to speak, and um, and it, it is th- that's the process. The process usually is that a juror, a, a group of jurors is called. They show up at the courtroom, and then uh, through a series of questioning, both sides are looking to find out whether a jury is an appropriate fit for the case. And they ask a series of questions, which is designed to kind of understand how their life experiences and how their beliefs might interact and whether there's any particular biases or particular life experiences or beliefs that might impair their ability to actually fairly and impartially judge the facts of the case. So that's that's technically sort of what the jury selection, the voir dire process is. The reason that I think it's it's so uncomfortable for a lot of attorneys is for two reasons. One is attorneys like to stay in control. And and it's very difficult because voir dire is really, you shouldn't be in control. It should be a conversation where actually the jurors themselves are controlling the conversation. The second aspect of of what's a little bit uncomfortable is that attorneys are trained in very specific questions. And actually the better questions in voir dire is to ask jurors open-ended, even vague and ambiguous questions such as, how do you feel about this? What do you think about this? Those aren't questions that attorneys like to ask. And the third reason that sometimes voir dire is a little uncomfortable for attorneys is that it is an exercise in masochism. Because jury selection is jury deselection. You are trying to identify jurors who are going to hurt you, who who are bringing stuff to the table that makes them negatively inclined toward you or your client or your case. And as a result, you have to get them to talk about those things that they hate about you, your client or your case. And it's kind of painful. 
So that's a lot of the difficulty, but it is actually one of the most critical parts of jury selection is finding out really who jurors are so that when you are then talking to them, as you say, because that report process, as you described, is also very important. And I find that instead of just introducing yourself, the more you listen to jurors, that's where they start to really realize, ah, he's listening to me, I'm gonna to listen to him during the trial. So it's a, it's a dynamic process, it's counterintuitive to a lot of attorney training, but it's critical so that you also know who's on your jury and then how to design your case presentation to address the audience you have. Yeah. Catherine, we were talking about this a little bit beforehand about that idea of it's out of the attorney's control and that, you know, they're spending hundreds of man hours and billable hours working these cases up and they know everything from 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 A to Z on their case. And now all of a sudden they're sitting in a room for the folks and they've lost control because they don't have control over the answers they're about to be given. What, 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 are, what are they looking for? What should an attorney be looking for out of folks? An attorney needs to be f focused on what are the biases? What biases do these people have inherently? And that's hard for regular people who might be listening to this um, to understand because it seems fair that you would just take the first 12 people who walked in off the street. I mean, what are you talking about? Me have a bias? What are you talking about? I don't have biases. Um, and yet we all have biases. I was telling you that the famous Catherine James is called for jury duty story. Right. Um, in which uh, I thought, oh, this will be interesting. I'll go in, I'll see what it is. It's a criminal case. Okay, great. Um, and I see this wonderful prosecutor. And then on the other, there, the next table, I see the defendant. And I think, gosh, I wonder where the wonder where the defense attorney is. And just as I'm thinking that, the judge says, well, one of the parties has asked for there to be 45 witnesses. And I'm thinking, 45 witnesses, what's going on here? And then he says, then he starts talking about how it's okay for a person to represent themselves. And I had a giant bias moment of going, <laughs> no, 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 no. There are wonderful public defenders and, and prosecutors in Los Angeles County. That guy sitting over there at that table is crazy. And it, I already <laughs> know, I already know there's no way I am going to acquit him of this. I'm already on the side of the, of, of the prosecution. I mean, get me out. I've got a giant bias. I, and I thought, wow, this it, that is bias. It comes at you. And when you're sitting on a jury, you need to know that's what they're that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that gut thing that you just cannot get over because it's a part of who you are. And, yeah. and Josh, I think on, on that level, you know, when we first started the whole aspect of jurors, usually they were local jurors, you know, way back when in, in the 1790s when we first started doing this, you know, small communities, everybody knew everybody, so they had a lot of knowledge. It evolved, obviously, as our populations grew, and it turns into, you know, we really wanted juries that were impartial, that really didn't have any interest, didn't have any knowledge about the whatever happened in the crime, things like that. And that has evolved, but the difficulty that we have these days is everybody with a smartphone knows a lot about everything and can have access to information about just about everything. So, and my God, you know, the number of, as we're on one now, true crime podcasts, true crime shows, where people bring a lot of knowledge about CSI and yeah. law and order and all that stuff about what they think a criminal trial should be or is, they're loaded. So finding out what their expectations are also is really important. I mean, Catherine's aware enough to, to have sit there and go, wow, I have a bias. But a lot of jurors have a hard time. They don't know. So again, the, the, the real challenge in voir dire is sometimes asking jurors about stuff they may not even be aware of themselves and, and helping them to work through how their life experiences or, or their belief systems might actually not necessarily have a bias, but have an impression, have a, a preference, have uh, some sort of preconception about how things should go. I mean, I've done a lot of criminal defense work, and I will tell you this, the fact that the prosecution has the burden of proof is really counterintuitive. 
most jurors actually walk into the courtroom going, well, you've been arrested. You were charged with something. It looks like they got a bunch of people that are going to test. That sounds pretty convincing. Why don't you tell me? You got to prove to me you didn't do it. Yeah. I wonder what he did is their question. Yeah. Right. So there's that. I mean, we kind of think, oh, no, burden of proof is on the prosecution in the case, but not really. Same thing with uh, defendants' right not to testify. Yeah. They're like, you're accused of this. Why wouldn't you testify on your own behalf? Yeah. So there's all these things you have to really probe into and discover when you're actually working on these cases. Yeah. You brought up the the C, CSI effect. I mean, that, that was a term that we used in the DA's office, and you would definitely have to voir dire on that because jurors have these preconceived notions that they're going to walk into an uh, you know, a armed liquor store robbery and that there's going to be DNA, uh, uh, videotape evidence, um, a satellite image of him escaping from the liquor store and, and <laughs> on and on and on and on. And I, I would voir dire on that. I would say, hey, who would have a problem if this is all the evidence I have? And nobody has a problem with that. But then you start peeling back the layers of, okay, I don't have videotape and I don't have fingerprints and I don't have DNA. And I don't, all I have is a witness who's going to tell you that that gentleman over there robbed him at gunpoint. Who's got a problem with that? And you start to get more and more people raising their hands. And those are the people you're trying to identify that might have a bias. Yeah. Just that whole notion of circumstantial evidence. I mean, that's just a, a you, you don't have a videotape. Well, I'm sorry. You know, it's yeah. just. That's, yeah. that's that expectation, which is tough for a prosecutor. So uh, we have a big question. It's from a listener. Um, the listener happens to be my wife. And her question is, how do I get off of jury duty? <laughs> and, and I'm serious about this question. This is something I'm sure you guys get asked all the time. I get asked all the time. It seems like the only thing they want to hear from me as a lawyer. But it's a, it's a serious question in that when you guys are listening, obviously bias is something you're trying to identify, but are there other red flags? Is there something else that people are saying that might not be so obvious that you're trying to keep your eyes and ears open for to identify for the attorneys as, hey, this could be trouble down the line? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> answer your wife's question, uh, uh, don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, jury, jury service, I mean, Catherine and I spend our time in the courtroom, so so it's it's really, really important. And I know it's incredibly inconvenient and sometimes really tedious and really difficult, but it's such an important, I really believe in the jury system because I believe that even with all the disputes over, over um, you know, voting rights even, that one of the core tenets of our constitution has to do with citizen juries. You know, we don't have this in pretty much anywhere else in the world, but the ability of citizens to resolve disputes, either in a criminal or civil case, I think is super important. So even though it's inconvenient, it's terrible, don't get out of jury duty. Be honest as to what you have biases are, but you know, it is, it is a, and most of the time, the people who've said, I hate doing this, I don't really don't do it. When they actually sit on a jury, they actually go, this was actually a really important experience. Yeah. Are you, are you disappointed you missed out, Catherine? Well, I'm going to say that, uh, no, because I, I have served. Just oh, that one. okay. You're um, lucky. Yeah. I'm lucky. I would say, uh, you know, um, the reality is, is why do you serve? Because next time it could be your kid. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. Because yeah. next time it could be you. Yeah. Either way, you could be the victim of a crime. You could be accused of something you didn't do. You In a civil case, you could be hurt by a defective uh, product. <laughs> uh, your kid could get killed through the negligence of a doctor. Um, or somebody could be accusing you of something and making wanting you to take responsibility for an injury that's not your fault. Yeah. Any moment, it could be you. That's why. That's yeah. why. Yeah. No, great points. Um, okay, next step along the way, we've now picked our jury. We've got 12 folks that w w w neither neither side uh, uh, was uh, thrilled with. So now you've got these people staring at you and you're about to do your opening statement. Um, Catherine, tell us about what, what, what should an attorney be trying to do and especially this idea of storytelling and a narrative. In order to tell, in order to um make sure that the jurors understand 
what it is that you want to get across, you need to do it in the form of a story. And by story, I don't mean that it's made up. Sometimes you say to somebody, oh, I teach, I, I help lawyers with storytelling. And they go, oh, you help them make up lies? Because everybody knows the courtroom's full of lies. And I go, no, it's as human creatures, we are hardwired like, it's a, like, we're, like we're computers. We're hardwired to accept story. And it's always going to be about the story. Um, for example, uh, you're going to pick uh, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy in, in, in your story. You're going to probably, like if you're prosecuting, you're going to talk about the defendant, what their actions were. You're going to tell the story from their point of view. So you're framing it that way. If you're uh, if this is a criminal case and you're representing the defense, you're going to do mistaken identity. You're going to do they didn't get the evidence. You're going to do you're going to do what did the other how did the other side screw this up? You're not going to talk about your guy like here. Um, and that is a very difficult concept for many attorneys to understand. And no doubt it's a difficult concept for um, some other folks who might be listening to this to understand while well, they're thinking there. Why aren't they talking about me? Well, we're not talking about you, darling, because we have to talk about the other side. We want the jurors to understand that story, that beginning, middle end. And the end is going to have to do with the jurors. Um, going ahead and, and, and making a conclusion, making a decision about the case. So that is, in a nutshell, what opening is. I was always amazed when I was a prosecutor that oftentimes some, not oftentimes, but sometimes defense attorneys would choose not to make an opening statement. And I, I understood that there was some strategic uh, thinking behind that, that they're trying to not oversell something, or perhaps they're just waiting to see what the prosecution's doing, and they want to pivot off of that. Um, but talk to us about what, what are some pitfalls, or what are some things that attorneys should try to avoid in an opening statement? Well, first of all, uh, uh, I think you only reserve openings if you've got multi-defendant cases, and you can have one attorney do opening and then reserve one of your other defendants and do an opening later on because opening statement is critical jurors yeah. do they don't necessarily decide on their verdict or this early in the case but they lean real heavily so first impressions everything we've heard about that is actually true and you really need to tell your story early the other thing is uh, stories uh, aren't just a chronology of events right you know it's really just not a sequence of events it doesn't just here's what happened you know, as Catherine has said, and she knows very deeply, jurors are really sophisticated, especially these days with all these great stuff on Netflix and Amazon. You, these these narratives are really complex and really involved. Jurors' expectation aren't just good guy, bad guy stuff. They really want some nuance. So they really need to tell a story and you need to develop not only a series of things. What Who are these characters? You know, and really not just the occupation of these people but really what are the who are these people and for both prosecutors as well as defendants you can't just sit there one of the biggest sins i think a lot of times is portraying everybody on our side's good everybody on their side's bad it's very black and white and i think that's a problem because for both prosecutors there's going to be some blemishes in the case you've got a witness that's you know, maybe not the most reliable or maybe as an inform you know a paid informant or things like that that you've got to rely on you know a checkered past and as a defendant oftentimes you do have some problematic stuff in their background too you gotta jurors are okay with that if you're upfront about it yeah. so you want to avoid that sort of beautiful portrait of oh we did nothing wrong here that's a that's a big problem so character is real important drawing out some real nuance in that uh, the environment, just context for jurors is critically important. So what, how, where does this occur? What, what is the events surrounding this actual alleged crime that happened um, that helps the jurors do it? And then obviously the action. And the action sometimes doesn't start with the actual crime itself. It has to do with the motivation of the people. Because even though as a prosecutor, you know, you don't necessarily have to prove motive. Jurors really want sure. to. They sure. want to know why. 
Why, 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 why? So that's, I mean, those are the things, if you don't provide those elements, you don't have the story that Catherine is talking about. And you have to have those things for jurors in order to, because otherwise they're gonna make it up themselves. No, Richard, you you, you bring up a really good point um, about not, that a pitfall can be painting uh, the story so 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 black and white and that there's no gray areas and that everybody on your side is the good guy and everybody on the other side is the bad guy. Some of the most um, powerful, impactful uh, openings that I've seen from the defense side of things is when they're willing to kind of take the sting out of the prosecution or the plaintiff's case by saying, listen, my client did do a bunch of things wrong or my client the corporation did do a bunch of things wrong and 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 maybe there's some responsibility there but what he didn't do is what they're accusing him of or what they didn't do is the extent to which the plaintiff is saying that they harmed them and it it really um, takes a lot of the bite out of the plaintiff or prosecution because then they can't oversell their case because they know that's the argument coming and that you've appeared to be at least so kind of reasonable yeah, and that too, that's evolved over time, that that system of let's admit uh, warts and all, that's yeah. evolved in the decades that, that that I've been doing this. It used to be that you just, um, there was this, this this belief that if you said it, that, that it was bad and you needed to wait for the other side to say it. And it was, yeah. it, I, I always thought it was ridiculous, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> But it goes to a fundamental misconception, I think, sometimes that that, um, you know, that the the quorum is really about the battle of which side they believe. And the truth is that that's not the way jurors make decisions. It's always going to be a hybrid. The more that I can sit there and say, here's my story. Here's what you're going to hear from them. And here's why elements of their story actually fits my profile of the case. If you can kind of incorporate that, that's obviously more persuasive as opposed to just ignore them. I'm the only story here. That's that's sort of the a, a better approach I find these days. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we've picked our jury. Uh, we've done our opening statement, and now we're turning to the loose cannons part of our case, where we have to actually start putting witnesses on the stand. So Catherine, start to walk us through witness preparation. What is what does that actually involve? Well, what that involves is bef long before you're taking the stand, um, you will be talking to your lawyer uh, about what that process is. In uh, you might be doing a deposition ahead of time. So you will have uh, talked to your lawyer, prepared for that. Uh, you start learning how to be a good witness and because it's a job. It's a job. Part of what you have to do, oddly enough, is turn all your faith and trust over to your lawyer. Can you imagine that? And it's your life story. Yeah. And something really horrific has gone on for you. But you have to put all your faith and trust into this other person. That's part of the process. Learning that you're not going to be responsible for all of the facts of the case. The lawyer is going to pick which witnesses, which witness is going to be responsible for what facts? That's another place where witnesses just freak out. Yeah. Well, I have to talk about this and I have to talk about that and I have to talk about that. No, you don't. No, 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 you don't. Someone else is going to talk about this. Uh, Mr. Lawyer, tell her who's going to talk about X. Mr. Lawyer, tell her who's going to talk about Y. See, that's covered. Don't worry. Don't worry. You have to learn how to think first and speak second. Like what we're all doing right now, we're thinking and talking at the same time. That's what we do. That will, that's a, a, a huge fault that many witnesses have. You have to get a question, you have to think about it, think through the answer, and then say what the answer is. And most of the time, it's going to be really short. It's a, it's a very intense, incredible process. And also, your emotions are going to be involved. You're going to be emotional because you will, because um, otherwise you're basically a robot and people don't trust or believe um, robots necessarily. Yeah. But I think I want to pivot off what Catherine just says. One, one of the things that Catherine does, I think, more brilliantly than pretty much anybody I know, which is the jury is sitting there going, OK, 
uh, both sides are, are sort of putting together their case for me and they're presenting their witnesses. And they understand that there's some artifice involved, that there's some sort of, okay, you're constructing a case only to support your side. What becomes important to them is the search for authenticity. So the, the credibility component of witness testimony has less just to do with, okay, are they, yes, are you lying or are you not lying? And you know, are you consistent or inconsistent? And things like that. Yes, that's important. But what jurors really want to know is, is this witness, do I feel like I know this witness, understand this witness, and that they're giving me what seems to be really God's honest, here's what I know, here's what I saw, here's what I did, without just the polish of the attorneys there. So sometimes it's a peeling process that I know Catherine spends time doing to kind of go, all right, great, we have to meet these evidentiary issues. We've got to meet these points that you want to make as an attorney with this witness, but let's figure out a way so that that jury gets that witness, that they kind of go, I, I, warts and all, you know, problems and all, mistakes and all, here's what I know, I feel like I can trust what that witness has to told me. And yeah. that's a that's an important part of the process too. No, absolutely. I I remember. I mean, m many times when you're in the DA's office, you you do not have the time to kind of prepare folks like you do in a civil case or in a larger kind of criminal case involving you know multiple murders or something where you're preparing for months. Sometimes you're throwing people on, and you may have met them just earlier that day. But right. one of the things I always tried to get across to folks is that, listen, your, your job is just to tell the truth as best you remember it. Your job isn't to argue with the other side. They're going to ask you questions. And I would tell them, listen, quite frankly, I don't care about the questions they ask. If I feel that they're objectionable, I'll make an objection and, and let me do that. But if they ask a bunch of questions that make it sound like you can't remember something or you're making something up, I get to ask questions again. So don't feel like you need to argue with them. Your job is just to give the answers as best you remember it. And I would I would do that because people, like you mentioned, get so caught up in trying to fight the whole case themselves and that this is their only opportunity to be heard. And that if they don't get this out right here and now, uh, it, no one's ever going to hear it. And that, to your point, uh, I think chips away at their authenticity. Um, so getting getting around to kind of problematic witnesses, uh, it, it, James, you had uh, I'm sorry, Richard, you had talked about this before that um, witnesses who talk too much or not enough or bring in their own kind of issues or ego problems. How is that? How can you help someone deal with that? Well, you know, Catherine does this, too, and, and it, it's a matter of you, you got to figure out what's the agenda that's driving the witness. Yeah. I mean, you, there I've worked with a ton of witnesses at Catherine's work at the time who are arrogant, who are uh, argumentative, who are defensive. And for me, that's not even necessarily the problem and the issue. It's really what's driving that. And, and getting that emotion, finding out in the witness preparation process, what does this mean to you? What's going on? with you that you are doing and being candid with them. Here's how you appear. And we either need to explain that to the jury or you need to get over it, uh, in which case, but you can't just get over it. You can, you need to talk through it. So there's a, there's a clinical psychology part of this, which is literally very therapeutic in nature, because as Catherine said, the trial itself is traumatic. It's also about an is conflict issues. So emotions run high. So finding out what's what's driving them is is helps to identify what are the problem issues with this witness so that you can then either address it with the jury, with them on the witness stand or help them move past it. I liken it to um, lawyers tend to look at uh, symptoms as diseases. If they were doctors, they look at a symptom and call it a disease. Talks too much is a disease. <laughs> too much is a symptom. It's yeah. a symptom. And it might not have anything to do with this case.
there are so many of the whys that you have to know rather than just say, don't talk so much. That that's it's not a disease. Talk too much is not a disease. It's a symptom. Right. Very, very good point. All right. So we've put on our case. We've we've got we've limped our way to the finish line. And now we are at closing arguments. So, so Catherine, again, kind of talk to us about what what are we trying to accomplish here at closing argument? Well, there are a couple of theories about closing argument, but the big the big thing that I think the biggest mistake that lawyers make is they is they think that it's just like opening, but more passionate. It's just <laughs> opening, but more passionate. Interesting. Um, you know. But it really is the closing argument. This is where you're going, you know what, people of the, our community, this is going to be in your hands now. This is going to be in your hands now. It's your last opportunity to say, OK, let me put all these things that we have talked about and that we have put forward. Let me put them into a package and let me help you take this back into the jury room and make the wise decision. But, and that that's a lot of what closing is. I'm sorry, Richard, you go ahead. No, no, no. I, I just wanted to, to echo that because a lot of times what I see, one of the big problems is that attorneys do think that um, exactly as Catherine said, that closing is a summary of the evidence. And they just fail to actually, it's an argument. So part of it is, yes, you are trying to take the elements in the trial that you, uh, but, but that, that you're connecting to the verdict. That is an important element, but that's not everything. What you are trying to do also is to say, here's what it means. Here's what it means to you as the jury. So you're trying to create some real emotional impact. And I don't care how dry it is, whether it's a biomedical device patent case, there's always an emotional impact that you should be trying to, to connect to the jury because that's where our real decision making is, which is how do I feel about this? What does this mean to me? And and so you're connecting the evidence to what the what the verdict questions are going to be, what the ev and you're connecting that evidence to that and the jury instructions. But then you're also trying to communicate a, a type of meaning to the jury themselves and why it's important for them to come back with the verdict for you. Yeah, excellent points. I, I remember I would always prefer when a judge, people who've not served on a jury or been inside a courtroom may not understand this, but one of the f last things that happens before a jury goes back to deliberate is the judge will read them the instructions. And this can take two hours sometimes of a judge just reading to these folks. And it's agonizing to get through. And a lot of it is just case law says certain, in, in, certain instructions have to be read. So we all have to sit there. But I always preferred when the judge would read the instructions first so that you could end on your closing rather than doing your closing and then hearing these instructions because of what you guys both pointed out is that you want them carrying a feeling and an emotion back into the jury room rather than you know having come out of the their semi comatose of having to li listen to someone read to them for two hours before they go be begin to deliberate. But Josh, you, you put out something very important. Yes, you want them to have that impact going back to the deliberation. But the other thing that you that is important about, which is one of the things that gripes me the most, is hearing instructions at the end of the trial. Because most times at the beginning of the trial, jurors are going, what's my job? Right. What am I supposed to be listening for? And we do that at the end of the trial after they've heard everything to say, oh, by the right. way, you should have been listening for all this stuff during the trial. <laughs> it's so counterintuitive. So it's yeah. if, if ju more judges pre-instructed, I'd be much happier. Yeah. yeah, you get to tell them what's going to be on the final at the beginning of the class. Right, right, <laughs> right. And now here's the final. <laughs> yeah. um, before we go, I want to get into the the war story. So there were a couple of cases that you both had kind of highlighted. And, and Catherine, I'll start with you because th this was fascinating to me. And I, I don't want to steal your thunder on it. But you you had talked about this as being the the vigilant policeman wakes up. Can uh, you tell us about that case and, and kind of how you were able to be involved and help out? Well, this was a, a case that I was involved in, a criminal defense case. And there was this um, 
wonderful criminal defense lawyer that I work with, wonderful guy. And he said, Catherine, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, this police officer, we need to plead this case. I said, okay. And so I'm talking to this wonderful, beautiful young man, gorgeous young man, who tells me the following story. He said, you know, I'm, I was in the bathroom and I was arguing with my wife. And then the next thing I knew, I was on my lawn and I was calling into headquarters and telling them that they had to come over because my wife had been decapitated and she's in the bathtub in my bathroom. Incredible. And I don't know how that happened, Catherine. And I said, oh, yeah, he said, but of course I could never have done that. I could never have done that. So I, I'm gonna plead um, not guilty. And I'm thinking, hmm. I said, well, you know, let's go through Let's just go through exactly what happened. And I took him through using um, what actors call uh, five senses, sense memory. I took him through the events of how they got there and how they were fighting. And of course she was pregnant and they were fighting and fighting and fighting. And all of a sudden he saw it. Wow. He saw it. Wow. And what a tragedy. Absolutely. You know, it's a total tragedy. And, you know, most of the people that I've worked with in what I would call blue collar criminal cases, which this poor police officer, that's a blue collar criminal case. You know, there's only one person in this whole world they're going to kill. They're not really a danger to the rest of us. And they suffer right. from some kind of a mental breakdown. And there's right. this whole prejudice against insanity defense, you know, and I think, yeah, you know what? Why would you why would you kill your wife who's carrying your unborn child? Because you have a mental problem, that's why. Because you have a mental problem. But that was God. a sad one. That was No, I can imagine. But, wow. That that I can imagine that's something that you you're you're not going to forget about for a very long ever, time. Ever. Yeah. 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 Uh, and Richard, you have a, a, a list of cases that everybody's heard of and we could talk about from O.J. Simpson to Aaron Hernandez to the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, but one case I have particular interest in is Phil Spector because you um, consulted, I know you at least consulted on, on jury selection in that case for the defense. And I happen to recognize your name because I was a law clerk uh, for Alan Jackson uh, who prosecuted that case for the DA's office. So walk us through a little bit about how that uh, all worked out and, and what your thoughts were on that case, if you can remember, because we're going back a few years now. <laughs> it is a few years ago, but it, it, that case actually stays with me a lot because it was such an unusual case in that um, you know, obviously very concerning to the defense. I mean, um, Phil Spector pleaded not guilty. And for those of you who don't remember this case, Phil Spector was a very famous music producer who developed what they called the wall of sound. And he worked with everybody from very early in the 60s all the way through the Beatles, uh, the Let It Be album, George Harrison, John Lennon, uh, and huge into the Ramones, just a tremendous number of, of significant pop stars. And he developed this stuff and, and he'd, he'd had a, a very problematic history um, and the judge was going to let in some very difficult evidence for us. So when I was called about the case, they said, well, okay, um, here's what's gonna happen. We've got um, five women who are going to testify. And, and in the case itself, he's accused of killing Lana Clarkson, who was an actress at the time who was at his house very late at night uh, and there's a gunshot wound. Uh, she's killed with a gunshot wound and was found the very next morning. Um, and so they said, look, you know, here's here's some of the issues that we're gonna be dealing with in the case. There, there's five women that are gonna be allowed to testify, the 1101B stuff that Judge Fiddler allowed in on uh, that are going to be testifying that Phil Spector pulled a gun on them and threatened them. And I went, okay, well, that's that's not good. Um, and then there's going to be uh, the limo driver 
who's also going to testify that he saw Phil Spector walk out of the house with a gun in his hand and said, I think I killed somebody. Uh, and also not good for you guys. Not, not good <laughs> evidence. And then, right. you know, Phil um, uh, had these some sometimes very crazy hairstyles and stuff. And so, and very eccentric. And so there was just the visual of him as being very eccentric. So there was a lot of, a lot of issues, a lot of problems in the case. And um, the, the fascinating thing for me, though, is that, you know, the, the, the very challenging part of this case was, you know, defense lawyers want to defend against everything. And so they wanted to really be critical of all these women that said that, pulled, and I was like, you really can't do that. And you just kind of have to let them testify. Because the truth was that Phil actually had never shot anybody before he pulled a gun on lots of people he pulled a gun on john lennon for god's sakes um and but he never actually shot at anybody um and so i said let these women go um and then there was things obviously that we weren't creating doubt about the witness testimony about it but the real issue that was the biggest challenge was to get past all these really kind of emotional things these five women and and that witness testimony because the the thing in the case is that the forensic evidence in the case was pretty showed fairly convincingly that she's holding the gun at the time it went off. So there's that element from a forensic standpoint, from a scientific standpoint, that we said we need to focus on that and make that really understandable for the jury. And then when we got into the jury selection elements of it, it was how do you choose a jury that's not going to be gravitating so much towards some of this really emotional evidence um, and is going to be more focused on the forensic evidence in the case. And so for me, that was why we did a counterintuitive thing. It was kind of challenging from the defense perspective because defense lawyers typically don't like engineers and they don't like, you know, they like to, and so I had to convince them to let we had two engineers on the jury, a, um, a court clerk, a vice president of marketing for New Line Cinema, a manager of a law firm, and an NBC producer who had actually covered the O.J. Simpson, the Michael Jackson, and the Phil Spector case early on. We ended up with those people on the wow. jury because I wanted really smart, really skeptical people who are going to kind of really take a good hard look at this stuff. So it was a really challenging case, obviously, sure. to kind of have this balance between are our jurors going to gravitate toward just some of that really emotional stuff? Are they going to focus on this and um, on some of the scientific stuff that we thought was fairly strong for us? And that was that was the real dynamic that we were looking at in that case. Incredible. Uh, well, we could go on for hours talking about these cases, but um, Catherine and Richard, I want to thank you both for coming on this week. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Actofcommunication.com. And my book is harvestingwitnessesstories.com. Right. And I can be reached at, at uh, decisionanalysisinc.com, which is our website. Um, I've also written a book on a number of these cases called Acquittal, um, uh, which is about the O.J. Simpson, the Casey Anthony, uh, the Phil Spector case, Enron, Whitewater, Heidi Fleiss, a couple of the different. I think everybody is going to want to get your book who's on this podcast, Richard, because it's got all the it's got all the great cases. <laughs> and you're such a wonderful writer and you bring them so to life. I just love I love his book. Obviously, I'm a big fan. As soon as we're done here, I'm going right on Amazon. Good. <laughs> and I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. And you can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, please tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD Sidebar. And thank you again for joining us at the Sidebar. <laughs>